every uh, spring, just before the summer season, uh, publishers always release their brand new books in hopes of uh, cornering the market on the upcoming vacation season. So sometimes they'll even advertise their books. They'll say, this is the perfect read uh, while you're setting the sand or for your next camping trip or whatever it is uh, for you. And then after, if you watch the list, after you get past like the action thrillers and the romance novels, uh, one of the most popular genres of books are the biographies or the memoirs. Just to give you an example, already this year I've got a picture of some that have already been released. So you see there's a, a memoir by John Stamos for all the Full House fans. And there's uh, Prince Harry, then the basketball player uh, Chris Paul released one. And then you have an, another memoir, which is like the fifth memoir for Paul Newman, the actor turned uh, producer, turned race car driver, turned salad dressing creator. So if you're into his story, uh, you might want to pick that up. If you're a person who's into reading, especially these kind of books, though, then you'll recognize that there's often something about reading another person's story that helps you make sense of your story. That's why this summer, as a church family, rather than sort of doing some one-hit wonders that I like to call them, uh, we're going to spend all summer exploring the biography of one of the most significant leaders in history. If we were to go around the room, we would be hard-pressed to name a person who played a greater role in more historically significant moments than the guy that we're going to look at. He's one of the heroes of the Old Testament, and even when you get to the New Testament, his shadow extends all throughout the New Testament. His name is Moses, and we're calling it uh, shadow work, because as we're going to see as we dig through his story, is that long before Moses ever stepped into the spotlight, there were some things that God had to do in the shadows to prepare him for that moment and help him to become the person that he was created to be. So if you have your Bible, your phone, I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 1. If you're using a paper copy, that would be the second book in the Bible. We're going to start right at the beginning of the second book. And while you're turning there, I want you to think about this question. If you were going to write your biography or your memoir, what would you title it? Now, one of the things that publishers do is they work really hard to try and give all of their books a, a catchy title in hopes of grabbing people's attention and hopefully enticing them to buy the book. So, for example, the great comedian Steve Martin uh, titled his autobiography, Born Standing Up, which is, which is you know, kind of catchy. Then Anderson Cooper titled his Dispatches from the Edge, a memoir of war, disasters, and survival. Let's think about this. If I was going to title mine, it might be Dispatches from Dairy Queen. That's, that's kind of what I thought. Or maybe Unfinished, My Life Working on Sermons. Uh, if you were going to give a title to the story of Moses, you'd have a lot of good options. If you go down to my office, you'll see all kinds of books about Moses. One of them is titled The Reluctant Prophet. Some of you have seen the movie The Prince of Egypt. There's another famous book where he's called The, the First Deliverer of e Israel. But whatever title you would choose, one word that you might consider including in the title is the word complicated. Because just like a lot of us, Moses' story is pretty complicated. For example, as we pick up the story at the beginning of Exodus chapter 2, Moses is, is right on the front edge of a full-blown midlife crisis. Now, one of the keys to understanding everything we're going to talk about this summer is that according to Acts chapter 7, Moses' life can be neatly divided into three distinct 40-year periods. We're going to put this on the screen just so you can see this. For the first 40 years of his life, as we're going to see today, uh, Moses really did live as a prince of Egypt. Then from about the age of 40 until he turned 80, he lived out in a desert called Midian. And then in the last 40 years of his life, the age of 80 to about 120, is when he leads the nation of Israel out of Egyptian slavery and towards the promised land. Now, most of the time, whenever we talk about Moses, it's those last 40 years that get all the attention. If you read any of the books about him, if you watch any of the movies, almost all the events that they talk about or portray come from that last 40 years. 
But to understand the last 40 years of his life, you have to hit the rewind button and go back to the first 80 years of his life because there's some things that happened during those first 80 years that set him up for what he's going to go through in those last 40 years. But keep in mind as we go through this, it's really complicated. I mean, from start to finish, his life is anything but simple. Just to set the stage for you, uh, the backstory to Exodus, you get to the beginning of Exodus, it's now been 400 years since the end of Genesis. So the end of Genesis, there's this guy named Joseph who winds up in Egypt. You know the story, the many colors and all that kind of stuff. And he winds up in Egypt. He eventually becomes the prime minister of Egypt, and he helps the Egyptian kingdom survive through this severe famine uh, because of his shrewd and careful planning. But now 400 years have passed, and over those 400 years, the memory of Joseph has faded into the background, while at the same time, the number of Hebrew people living in the kingdom of Egypt has continued to explode. So you have this Pharaoh who's now long down the line of Pharaohs. He doesn't remember Joseph. He doesn't know anything about Joseph. And he looks out, and he sees all these Hebrew people, and he says, we've got a problem. So he comes up with this plan to enslave the Hebrew people. When that doesn't work, he moves to plan B, and he says, instead of enslaving them, we're going to slowly eliminate them. And his plan is, we're going to kill every Hebrew baby boy that's born, and over time, they'll die out, and that'll get them under control, and we'll be safe. When that doesn't work either, he moves to plan C. And plan C is really kind of in your face, and he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go, and we're going to capture every Hebrew baby boy that we can find, and we're going to throw them in the Nile River. And the presumption, of course, is that if you throw the babies in the river, the crocodiles are going to take care of the babies. So you get to chapter 2 of Exodus. You read the story of Moses being born into this, this Jewish family, this Hebrew family, which, of course is really complicated because his mother knows if the Pharaoh's soldiers find her baby, they're going to take it and throw it in the river, and that will be the end of the story. So she does her best to keep him hidden until he hits about three months old, and then she comes up with this plan to save Moses' life by giving him away, which is essentially what happens. She comes up with this elaborate plan. She puts him in this basket. She hides him over in the weeds. She sees Pharaoh's daughter, who's the princess of Egypt. She pushes the basket out. The princess sees the baby, falls in love with the baby, and adopts the baby as her own. God even works behind the scenes where Pharaoh's daughter, the princess of Egypt, hires Moses' mother to watch after the baby until it's time for him to move in and become a son of Pharaoh. I told you, this is really complicated. Right from the very beginning, here's Moses, and he's growing up, and he's trapped between two worlds. It's like right from the beginning of his life, he, he never really fits in with either side. On, on one hand, he was born into a family that's a part of this enslaved people group. On the other hand, he lives in the palace of the most powerful man on the planet who also happens to be the one who's enslaving his ancestors and his kinfolk. I mean, he is trapped between two different worlds. To make it even more complicated, not only did he grow up as a member of Pharaoh's family, as an adopted son of Pharaoh, there's one ancient historian, a guy named Josephus, who says that this particular Pharaoh had no heirs. And so he had no successors to the throne. And so he makes the case that not only was Moses adopted in the family, that he was preparing Moses to eventually become the Pharaoh himself. In Acts chapter 7, there's an early Christian leader named Stephen who preaches this sermon, and in the sermon, he retells the story of Moses, and he makes one statement that's really important to understand if you want to understand the story of Moses. Here's what he said. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech in action. So here you have this guy, he's adopted into Pharaoh's family, and not only is he adopted and given a place to live, he's educated in all the ways of the Egyptians. And you have to remember when all this was happening, Egypt was by far, I mean, light years ahead of everybody else. They were the most 
advanced civilization on the planet. And so here's Moses, and he's being given a world-class education in preparation for his future. As a part of that, he would have learned about military history, political science, economics, law, philosophy, communication, probably even some theology. So here's Moses, world-class education, lives in the palace, potentially a successor to the throne. And at at the same time that all of that is going on, there's something else that's going on in his heart, in the shadows of his heart. And he knows that eventually his heart is going to be radically redirected. And it all happens at the age of 40 when Moses decides that he's had enough of this and he leaves the comfort of Pharaoh's palace and he wants to to reconnect with his roots. You might think about this like somebody who's been adopted and they go and they want to find out more about their family of origin so they go off to see what they can find. The problem in this instance, though, is that as soon as Moses arrives on the scene, something happens that causes his life to go completely off the rails. I want you to look at this with me. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were, and he watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So he had this kind of one, you know, kind of volcanic moment. Here's Moses, and he sees what's happening, and all of that rage and all that inner turmoil kind of comes surging to the surface, and in one, you know, this violent eruption, he kills this Egyptian. My suspicion is, probably didn't mean to. I mean, it's not like he set out, I'm going to go out and, you know, kill somebody today. It's just that, that once he got started, he couldn't stop. Once he saw this act of injustice that was taking place, he took it upon himself to stop that injustice. So it wasn't like it wasn't like his heart was in the wrong place. It was just that he he did it in the wrong way. And then let me give you a warning that you see demonstrated over and over again throughout the life of Moses. And here it is. Whenever we do things our way, instead of God's way, guess what? things get really complicated. Whenever we do it our way, instead of God's way, things get really complicated. You've experienced that. As you go through life, all of us, we keep running up against these situations in which we have a choice to make. We can either do it, we can either do it God's way or we can do it our way. And you see it in lots of different areas. Our relationships, our career choices, the way we operate as families, the way we handle money, the way we treat people, the way we treat people that we disagree with, the way we behave, the way we talk, what we watch, what we listen to, what we expose our minds to. It's like over and over again, we keep running up to these these moments in which we have this decision to make. We can either do it God's way or we can do it our way. And whenever we choose to do it our way instead of God's way, the results are always predictable. Things get really complicated <clears throat> really fast. Relationships are strained. Careers get upended. Addictions are formed. Families disintegrate. Businesses collapse. I mean, you know how it goes because you've experienced You did that over your life. Probably the, the worst things that have ever happened to you, the worst decisions you've ever made, you look back and think, boy, if I'd have done it God's way, Instead of my way, it wouldn't look anything like it looks now. And that's exactly what happened to Moses. In one rage-fueled moment in which he chose to do it his way rather than God's way, he complicated his life in a way that took him 40 years to unravel. 40 years. And when you get to verse 13, the full weight of of what Moses has done begins to bear down on him. Look at how this goes down. The next day, so this is the day after he kills the Egyptian, he went out and he saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, 
Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, What I did must have become known. You know, there was a big part of Moses that was hoping nobody saw this. This will just go away. We'll all move on. But now he finds out that his secret is out. There's no going back. And then you get to verse 15. And what was a bad situation becomes a worse situation because word of what Moses has done reaches the man in charge. Check out verse 15. When Pharaoh heard this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh. Check out this next part. And went to live in Midian where he sat down by a well. Now this is one of those verses easy to rush past, but if you're going to understand the rest of Moses' life, you need to understand what's happening here. Directly on the heels of one incredibly stupid decision, Moses goes from being a potential successor to the throne to becoming number one on the Egyptian most wanted list. Because of that, he's forced to leave the spotlight that he's kind of gotten used to of Pharaoh's palace, and he eventually finds himself living in the shadows of of a desert called Midian. Now, I told you earlier, one of the ways to view this part of the story is that Moses is on the, the front edge of what most of us would call a midlife crisis. He's reached a point at the age of 40 where he's sitting next to this well, which is nowhere near where he expected to end up. I mean, when Moses was a kid... This was not what he was thinking about. When he was sitting in all those classes, you know, at that Egyptian university, preparing for what was going to happen next, he could have never imagined that one day in the future, he would blow his life up to the point that he would wind up far removed from everything he knows, everything he's gotten used to, and wind up in a very dark and very lonely place. So, so here he is at the age of 40, and just like some of us, Moses finds himself in a position in which he's now convinced that his best days are behind him and his future is increasingly uncertain. Let me ask you, you ever felt like that? You ever felt like your window for accomplishing whatever it is you were hoping to accomplish was closing? You ever felt like your best days were behind you? Earlier I asked you to think about if you were going to write your story, what would you title it? And if we were honest, some of us would have to title something like Wrong Turns and Missed Opportunities. So you have a job, and it pays the bills, but it's not the job you dreamed about when you were younger. And you have a family, and you love your kids, but deep down inside, it's not what it could be. And you know that. And you have a house, you have a car, and maybe a boat, and a camper, and maybe you got some money in the bank, but, but even with all of that, it still feels like something important is, is missing. And occasionally, maybe you have these moments of clarity in which you realize that, hey, something's missing, Something needs to be done, but the more you think about it, the more you realize how complicated it all is, and so you just sort of let it go. So what do you do when you find yourself in a position in which life is really complicated? Moses' situation, about as complicated as you can get. He's lonely, he's wanted, he's isolated, he's angry, he's confused, he's disillusioned. And at some level, he's defeated. And to make it even worse, something you might have skipped over in verse 15 makes it clear that this is not a temporary condition. This was his new reality. Verse 15 says, he went to live in Midian. Your translation might say, he settled in Midian. This is not a temporary visit. This is where he now lives. And some of you can relate to that because somewhere along the line, you've settled for something. You've settled in a place that you know is not where you should be. So what do you do? You look at Moses' story. There's three things that can serve as a model for us 
whenever life takes a complicated turn. Here's the first one, if you're keeping track. You, whenever life gets complicated, it's important that we start small. One of the things we know about Moses is that even as he was growing up in Pharaoh's house, he's being educated, you know, in all the ways of the Egyptians, we know there's a part of him that is feeling a different calling. We know that God is doing something in his heart because that's the reason he eventually goes out to check on his people. It's not that he was curious, it's that he felt called to go. And, and there's a part of me that thinks he probably knew that God was preparing him for something in the future. That's why when we get to Exodus 3, we'll learn more about that. But in this moment, Exodus 2, it's obvious that, that Moses has dreams about playing some role in the future that will enable his people uh, to live in freedom. And deep down inside, that's what all of us really want. I mean, the things that drive most of us are not the desire to be wealthy or powerful or rich or famous or any of that. It's the desire to feel significant. Uh, the psychologist John Dewey said it this way. He said, the deepest urge in human nature is the desire to be important. All of us want to feel like we're doing something significant in a way that will be remembered. And I think that's what Moses is feeling here because that's what all of us feel. He's found himself sitting next to a well in a place that's far from home, surrounded by people he doesn't know, and he, he comes to this conclusion that his opportunity has now passed him by. Some of you have felt that same way. When you were younger, you had big dreams. Oh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go here. I'm going to do this. Everybody's going to know about it, and it's going to be awesome. But now it feels like you've, you've settled for something less than what could have been. That's where Moses was. But then you get to verse 16, and Moses unexpectedly encounters the situation in the grand scheme of things doesn't seem to make any difference but it turns out to be the first step on his road back to significance check this out now a priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock some shepherds came along and drove them away but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock again you see Moses has this heart for the marginalized for the the mistreated and it comes shining shining through so even in, the, in this part of the world even today it's not unusual for you to see teenage girls go out to get the water to water their families flocks and here's these seven girls and they come and apparently there's some shepherds there who are kind of bullying the girls and Moses sees that and he's not going to stay for that so he confronts the bullies and sends them packing and waters the waters the flock and it's a foreshadowing of what's going to happen later it's like god's preparing him to confront a a much more powerful bully when he'll stand before pharaoh and say uh, let my let my people go but he doesn't know that like in this moment all he knows is that he's seen an opportunity to help somebody who needs help so he starts small right where he is and just so you know that's normally how it works. That's normally how it works. Long before you stand in the spotlight, there are normally some things that have to happen in the shadows to prepare for what's to come. So before you write a best-selling book, it might be that you need to write some thank you notes to some people who've invested in you. And before you plant, you know, the next hot church, it could be that you need to go preach at the nursing home. And before you stand on the stage and deliver your first, you know, TED Talk, it, it could be that you need to go volunteer in the children's ministry for a few months. Before you write, you know, your big six-figure check to the church after you hit it big, it could be that you need to get in the habit of, of writing some some three-figure checks because that's how it works long before you ever stand in the spotlight there's a lot of things that have to happen in the shadows and most of the time they're small things now here's the second thing that you can do whenever life gets complicated and that's that you have to embrace obscurity and again this goes against everything within us but when you get to verse 18 these shepherd girls return home 
they tell their father, Ruel, about what's happened. And when he hears the story, he immediately sends him back and he invites Moses over to dinner. Look at how this goes down. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he, Ruel, asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Now, we read this. We think, oh, that's nice, simple invitation. Have him over for dinner. Hey, thanks for saving my daughters. But it's not that. In the ancient world, what Ruel is doing here is he's inviting Moses to settle down permanently. He said, hey, why don't you come and be a part of our family? I got seven daughters. You can kind of choose the one you want, and you can join the family business, and then we'll all live happily ever after. But keep in mind, Midian is not where Moses wants to live. And shepherding is not what Moses wants to do. If you go back to Genesis 46, there's this interesting note where it says, all shepherds are detestable to Egyptians. And so you got to remember, here's Moses, even though he was born into Hebrew family, raised as an Egyptian, so now he spent his whole life looking down on shepherds, and now he's being invited to join a group of people that he spent his life looking down on. What's Ruel doing here? He's saying, hey man, this may be as good as it gets. So why don't you come and embrace this life of obscurity? And again, that goes against everything we think we know, but that's a pattern you see all throughout the Scripture. Oftentimes, before God chooses to use someone in a significant way, He first makes them live through a season of obscurity. For Jesus, it was 40 days out in the desert before He preached His first sermon. For Moses, it would be 40 long years before he would ever go back to Egypt, and it didn't seem like anything was happening. But what he didn't know was that during that time, God was preparing him for what was going to happen next. But again, at this moment, he has no idea. All he knows is that this is not what he thought he was signing up for. And then you get to verse 21, and he kind of puts all this in perspective. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. You ever felt like that? You ever felt like you were stuck somewhere that you didn't really want to be? That was Moses' life. Now, keep in mind, it's not all bad. I mean, he's got a job, pays the bills. He's, by this point, he's become a father. So you know he loves his kids, probably loves his wife. I mean, here it's, it's, it's not all bad, but it's not great either. And by this point, Moses has fallen into the trap that, that so many of us eventually fall into. Every morning, he gets up early, and he goes, and he does his job. And then when the day's over, he goes home, he eats dinner, and he spends a little time with his kids. And then he goes to bed, and he gets up early the next day, and he does the same thing day after day. And it, it's, it's not bad. But it's not what he wanted, but that's his life. Hour after hour, day after day, decade after decade. And that brings us to the last thing. And to be honest, this is really the hardest one. When all of that's going on, when you, whenever life gets complicated, you have to continue to trust God's promises. See, here's the thing. If at any point during those 40 years that Moses is out there in the desert, if at any point you had somehow been able to, like, turn on the news, right, and just catch up on what's happening, it would have looked as if God was losing and Egypt was winning. I mean, the whole time Moses is out there, whatever standard you want to use, the whole time he's out there toiling his life away, watching his father-in-law's flock, Egypt is experiencing record economic growth, they're amassing military strength on a scale the world never seen. The technological advancements, the art advancements, I mean, it looked like Egypt was winning in every category and God was losing. Until you get to verse 23. 
during that long period, 40 years, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. A thousand years earlier, God had spoken to a guy named Abraham. He said, I'm going to take your descendants and I'm going to make them into a great nation. So what you see throughout the Old Testament is the story of God's people starts with this one man's family. But if you know the story, you know it was a promise that was repeatedly delayed and derailed before it was eventually fulfilled. By the time Moses arrived on the scene, it was a promise that looked as if it had been permanently denied until the moment that God heard and God remembered. You say, why did it take so long for God to hear? And I don't know the answer to that. But here's what I do know. Whenever God promises something, he always delivers. One of my Old Testament professors, Dr. Vic Hamilton, said it this way. He said, for God to remember is not to recollect accidentally, but to take action deliberately on what is recalled. Last weekend, we sang a song, some of you remember it, and it's got this line in the song that says, even when I don't see it, you're working. And that's the way it usually works. One famous preacher summarized Moses' story this way. He said, Moses spent his first 40 years thinking he was somebody. He spent his second 40 years learning he was a nobody. And he spent his final 40 years discovering what God can do with a nobody. I have a picture I want to show you. You will not recognize this guy. His name is David Burner. He started out as a journalist, but he made it his name for himself as a radio DJ in the city of Chicago. Back in 2011, uh, he released a memoir titled Accidental Lessons, in which he told a very personal story of his own midlife crisis. In a matter of months, he went from having a pretty successful career to being laid off because the radio station was trying to save money. The financial impact caused him to kind of go off the rails. His wife moved out. They were separated. He couldn't find a job. It was just a total meltdown. Not long after that, his father, who he grew up idolizing, was diagnosed with cancer, and within just a few months, he had passed away. At that point, he decided his old life was over. There was nothing to go back to. So rather than continuing to look for a job in radio, he decided to try his hand at being a school teacher. So he became an English teacher at one of Chicago's uh, toughest inner city schools, where by his own admission, he said he spent his days uh, teaching English to classrooms filled with society's throwaways. And throughout the book, he talks about some of the accidental lessons that he learned from the kids that he was supposed to be teaching. But as the book comes to an end, it's kind of a cliffhanger. It leaves a lot of questions unanswered. One reviewer of the book in the New York Times said this, said this book tells you about the questions he's asking but says nothing about who he's becoming. Three years later, 2014, he released a second memoir titled Any Road Will Take You There, in which he tells the story of now that he's a freshly divorced father of two, he and his two boys went on this 5,000-mile road trip across the United States, and he talked about the conversations they had and the lessons they learned and some of the things that impacted him from that journey. But here's the thing. If you were to look him up today, if you go to his Amazon page, you'll realize he's now added four or five more books. He's all labeled them as memoirs to, to add to his story because the story keeps changing. It keeps, it keeps evolving. Now, think about this. If you, if you took Moses, right? If you said, Moses, I want you to write your story. If, he, if he'd done that at 20, it would have looked a lot different than it looked at 40. And if he'd have written another version at 40, 
it would have looked a lot different than it did at 80 and at 120. So here's my point in all this. Some of you here right now, if I handed you a piece of paper and a pen, I said, I want you to write your story. To be honest, your story would not be all that compelling. I mean, there might be some good parts. There might be some parts you're proud of. But, but overall, it would not be what it could be or what you know it should be. But here's the good news. No matter how complicated your story is, it can change. You can rewrite it. You can keep adding new chapters. You can keep moving in new directions. You can write a whole new story. That's how this works. That's what Moses did. And that's what we can do. I want you to stand with me. One of the things I hope you've heard today is that no matter how complicated your story is, you can have a fresh start. But here's the thing. A fresh start always begins with a small step in a new direction. So if you're here this morning and you're ready to take that step, we'd be honored to help you. We'll pray with you. We'll talk with you. We'll answer questions. We'll do anything you need us to do. Maybe you're here and you're ready. You know exactly what that step is that you need to take, and you're ready to take it. So maybe you're ready to be baptized into Christ. You're ready to pray with somebody. You're ready to join the team here at FCC. Whatever it is you feel the Holy Spirit calling you to do, we're here to help you. We're going to sing a song together. If you want to talk to somebody or pray with somebody, you just meet us on this front row. We'll be glad to help you.